Hi everyone, this is Neil Wright, a consultant audiologist and director of Clearwax. Thank you for joining me in my latest video using the iClearscope Endoscope. And this is the sequel to yesterday's procedure where a patient attended with bilateral bacterial otitis externa. And I showed you their right ear procedure yesterday and this is their left ear today. So it's not as, um, as infected or severely as infected as their right ear, but they have got this accumulation of dead skin and debris very deep in the ear canal, which wasn't really causing much of a hearing loss. You can see there's a, there is a bit of an opening there for sound waves to travel through and vibrate against the eardrum, but their main complaint um, was itchiness and irritation. So what I'm going to try and do at least is remove as much debris as possible. Not only will it hopefully help the patient's itchiness and irritation, but when they are um, subsequently prescribed any medication by their GP, it's going to allow the medication to really penetrate against the canal wall itself and better fight away any um, harmful bacteria that's causing this bacterial infection for the patient. So um, now I'm using at the moment the standard zona suction probe. But I am going to revert in a moment to the fine end suction probe, which is of a smaller diameter. So here we are now. Um, they both have their um, pros and cons. So with a zone of suction probe, there's obviously um, greater suction power. Uh, with a zone of suction probe, the diameter is around 2 or 2.1 millimetres in, in thickness. So you don't really want to exceed that when performing oral micro, micro suction. If you have a, uh, an increased diameter over that, it can be difficult to insert into the patient's ear. Um, it can also um, be quite, uh, well, microsuction is noisy anyway, but it will be even noisier. The larger the, uh, the diameter suction probe, the more suction power, the noisier it's going to be for the patient. So for patient comfort, I, I, I don't really like using anything larger than uh, a zonal suction probe. And it may generate too much negative pressure in the ear and um, cause the eardrum itself to displace and move laterally towards the entrance, which we don't want. Now, I've never uh, heard of any instances where uh, a patient has suffered um, physical trauma to the eardrum due to the um, negative suction power created by a suction probe. But there is the potential if you use, um, if you apply too much um, suction in the ear. So, um, so that's the overview of the zonal suction probe. And I'll just show you that actually. So. We've got a zona suction probe here. Um, so you've got the handle. And in the UK, it's integrated. It's injection molded or bonded. And then you attach a fine end. So a fine end is an extension, it's a push fit. You simply push it on. Um, and it's a lot narrower, the tip of the fine end. It's about 1.3 or four millimeters, the diameter. But the problem with this system is that it actually makes the suction probe longer, um, which makes it sometimes a bit more difficult to control in the ears, particularly when you're near the eardrum. So I prefer a different, different system. So I use what we call a lower lock system where you've got a handle with a male lower lock there. And if I want to use the Zolner suction probe, I simply attach it on and it's extremely secure. Um, but you can also rotate it, however, so if you want to adjust the angulation to get better access in different parts of the ear canal, you've got that flexibility and option. And if I then want to use a fine end, although you, you can attach the fine end to the tip, um, but instead you just remove that and you attach a fine end suction probe. And it's nice and easy and it, you can use the fine end without the additional length as well. Um, so yeah, that's my preferred system where you simply have one handle and you attach whichever size suction tip you want. Uh, but traditionally in the UK, this is the normal system. And you've got a zona suction probe and you attach a fine end on top of that. So we're working quite close to the patient's eardrum now. There's uh, this thick blanket of skin. It's in the inferior recess. Um, this patient's ear canal was quite inclined to it, it kind of an upward slope. Um, I don't know if you saw that, but uh, um, now most adult ear canals are, there's an upward slope around 32 degrees, but I would say this patient's a bit more than that. And then it goes up and then as it approaches the eardrum, it goes back down again. So it creates a valley and that's the inferior recess when it goes down. And sometimes you can't, even with an endoscope, it's really, really difficult to examine um, and 
inspect the inferior reef, especially if the patient's outer part of the ear canal has quite an, an upward trajectory like this patient has. So I've more or less cleared the, the bulk of the debris, but I'm just going to go around now and remove as much um, macerated skin off the canal wall. Um, you can see, you may have noticed that just before I went into the ear, the entire concha bowl was really dry and cracked and so was the entrance. Uh, so hopefully this patient can get treated. Um, and I, I explained in yesterday's video, I recommend this patient have some custom swim moles made uh, once the infection has resolved. So this layer of skin came from nowhere actually. It wasn't really visible until um, I grabbed uh, the tail end of the skin and as I started peeling it, it was a thick layer, which is a pleasant surprise. Um, as I'm going into the ear, I don't know whether you've noticed, it, the, the lens got a bit foggy and misty. Um, and that's just because this patient's ear canal, the temperature is somewhat raised because of the, the inflammation and the infection. And all that humidity, uh, because the lens of the endoscope is the coldest part when we enter it in the ear, it settles on the tip. Um, it will naturally clear itself. If I just remained in the ear with the endoscope for about 20 or 30 seconds, it will demist itself. But as soon as you enter with the suction probe, when you vacuum the ear, that reduces the ear temperature. So it eradicates um, the condensation at the tip of the endoscope. Um, you may have, uh, I don't know whether you guys watched it, but I was on um, uh, ch channel four in the UK, so uh, back in September, and I did a live procedure. And um, they really, really, really wanted me to remove the wax using a correct because they wanted that eureka moment where you can see the wax um, at the end of the correct. Um, but although the patient's earwax was suitable for removing with a correct, the, the studio was extremely humid. And when we're doing the dress rehearsal, I did say that I don't know whether it's possible to, to remove it with um, uh, a correct because it may just condensate uh, against the lens. And um, the producer said, oh, that's fine. If you need to use the correct, use the correct. And so when it came to um, the actual procedure, there was, I had an earpiece, it was, it was invisible, and I could tell straight away that it was gonna, um, well, I, I did try and remove it with a correct, but the lens was really fogging up. So each time I tried to um, use the suction, I, they were really going into my ears, said, no, no, use, um, don't use the, the suction. And they kept calling it a scalpel. Um, so they mis, mis, mistook, uh, mis, mis, um, understood the word um, correct for scalpel and it's all I could hear and so I thought okay let me go back again let me just clean the tip of the, um, the, the endoscope let me hover it for a few seconds to see if it demissed but it just wasn't happening and in the end I felt like pulling the earpiece out but I just had to ignore them and just do what's right um, I know they wanted their, um, their um, money shot but it just wasn't right for the patient um, and I was struggling to actually see on that day um, uh, but when I used the suction, as I said, it cools the ear temperature down and it demists the, the the lens of the endoscope. So all was good in the end. Um, so again, I'm just using the fine end and peeling away some soft um, skin that's just at the osseocartilaginous junction. So this is the part of the ear where the bone and cartilage meet. Um, you can only tell because the skin that lines the, the bony section of the ear canal is a thin layer of skin. So it, you're able to see the blood vessels a lot more. So that part of the ear canal seems a lot more glossy. And underneath you've got the bone as well, which of course is more rigid than cartilage. Whereas the skin that lines the outer third of the ear, you've got three layers. So the skin has more of a, a matte com a complexion and it's less uh, generally less red because the blood vessels are and the deeper layers of the skin, so they're not as evident. And I don't know if you guys, by watching it, whether you are able to see the boundary um, between the cartilage and bone in this patient. So uh, as I'm going in and out, have a look, see if you can identify that. So really happy with that. Um, hopefully the patient can get their uh, prescribed um, antibiotics. Um, take care, guys. Keep well and speak soon. Bye.